to Moriah. I am a writer and theatre maker, and my work revolves around orature, or the use of actions as an aesthetic means of expression. And today I will share with you a few stories around the theme, because I always feel like running. These are stories about East African runners, particularly between the 1950s, sorry, the 19, 1960, 1960 to 1968. Enjoy. And because I'm a storyteller, one of the rules of storytelling is audience participation. It's the one thing that enlivens a storyteller. And so before I start, I'm going to teach you a few songs that will come in handy along the way, okay? Perhaps you know some of these songs because they're songs that are chants that are popular in sports uh, events. The first one is Steam. Steam. Panda. Yes, steam like panda, panda. So when I say steam, you say panda, which means rise. Steam. Panda. Steam. Panda. So it's steam, panda, steam, panda, panda. Okay? Steam. Panda. Steam. Panda. Steam. Panda. Steam. Panda. Panda. Then tension. Shuka. Going down. Decrease. Tension. Tension. So it's tension, shuka. Tension, shuka, shuka. Tension. 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 Steam. 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 Tension. 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 Another is call and response. Right? When I say asuaye, you say ya ya. Asuaye? Ya ya. Now you have to say it with a bit of energy. Because again, the feedback loop between the audience, the, end, the, the story, and the storyteller is what creates the event. Asuaye? Ya ya. Asuaye? Ya ya. Asuaye? Ya ya. Ya ya. It means, are we together? Yes, yes. It's gibberish, actually. So it can mean anything, but I choose to mean it this way. Another is Tunae Keino, Ah Keino, Tunae Keino. So we start with the first one. <coughs> um, I'll tell you, it's Tunae, the name of the athletes. Tunae Keino, Ah Keino, Tunae Keino, Hamtamweza. It means we have Keino. <laughs> And you're not going to. <laughs> you can't. Yeah? You can't defeat him. No. Tunae keino, ah keino. Tunae keino, ham tam weza. Tunae keino, ah keino. Tunae keino, ham tam weza. Thank you. In 1935, the mad king, Benito Mussolini, invaded the last free African empire, Abyssinia, present-day Ethiopia. In 1935, the mad king rolled into Abyssinia with his tanks, trucks, armored cars, portable anti-aircraft guns, handguns, grenades, flamethrowers, missiles, cartridges, and shells. In 1935, the mad king Benito, with his half a million fascist soldiers, outnumbered and overwhelmed the Ethiopians. War ravaged the fields, living prairies, and meadows stained with blood. In 1935, the mad king succeeded, and he exiled the Lion of Judah, the Emperor Haile Selassie, 
A reign of terror started, a blanket of darkness covering the last free African empire. In 1935, the Belgians in Congo praised the name of the Mad King. The British in East Africa held parties in his honor. White settlers in Southern Africa raised their stained wine glasses. The French in West Africa tipped their colonial hats off. The Germans, brooding over losing their colonies, began a fatal courtship with the Mad King. All of the European empires proclaimed, finally, finally, Africa is subdued. No more Abyssinia to look up to. No more Abyssinia to inspire calls for freedom and self-determination. The Lion of Judah will no longer roar for independence. Under occupation, Abyssinia was robbed without a tint of shame. Of the many things that were taken from the empire, one in particular disturbs both the living and the dead. A gravestone, the obelisk of Axiom, a fourth century granite monolith carved from a single solid block of granite stone, rising 24 meters high, weighing 160 tons. How? It was carved and installed in Axiom, a seismic region, is a mystery. At the foot of this heavy gravestone are two false doors. The rest of the stone is ornamented by equally false framed windows. The mystery of this obelisk filled the mad king Benito's heart with lust. He wanted to turn a symbolic door into the afterlife in Abyssinia, into a symbol of victory in Rome. He wanted to make a statement that he had not only conquered the living, but also the dead. In 1935, his soldiers labored for days, weeks. They broke the heavy gravestone into smaller pieces, loaded it into trucks and military vehicles, transported it via torturous, winding roads, traveling from miles from Axiom to Adwa, Adwa to Rama, Rama, across the border into Eritrea to Darwa, from Darwa straight to the city of Asmara, from Asmara to the port of Masao. There, piece by piece, they offloaded the heavy gravestone and loaded it into a ship named Adwa. Adwa crawled away from the port of Masao, ferrying the bulky cargo across the Red Sea, squeezing it through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean, set course for Napoli. And there, they offloaded the heavy gravestone and loaded it into more trucks and military vehicles, transported it via road to Rome, where it was reinstalled and reassembled on the square Porta Capena. For the next 25 years, the obelisk of Axiom remained lost to the people of Abyssinia. For the next 25 years, the doors into the afterlife remained shut. For the next 25 years, the dead remained restless. But not anymore. You see, the Ethiopian soldier, Abebe Bikila, has illuminated the path towards the obelisk. After 25 years of waiting, the Ethiopian soldier, Abebe Bikila, has broken the silence that mummifies the heart. The people of Abyssinia can finally say, but we see her obelisk, and we want it back. Asuaye. Yeah, yeah, Asuaye. Yeah, yeah. Asuaye. Yeah, yeah. We want it back, Asuaye. Yeah, yeah. He 
His name is Abebe Bikila, or Abe, as what close friends and family like to call him. Abe, a young man with a fierce spirit. Abe, able to withstand immense pain. Abe, small, lean, with a box-like forehead. Awe Abe wears a stern look heightened by the slight folding of skin between his eyebrows. Abe, from the village of Jato. Abe was only a boy when the bombs began to fell in Jato. Abe was only a boy when he was forced to run deep into the Abyssinian highlands, running away from the mad king, leaving his family behind. Abe was only a boy when he returned back home and the rage of war had dulled down only to find his father's body lifeless, his mother missing. Twenty-five years later, Abe is now all grown up and a soldier in the 5th Infantry Regiment of the Imperial Guard, tasked to protect the Emperor of Ethiopia, and he, find him, and he finds himself in the 1960s on board a twin-engine jet headed to Rome on a rare mission, the Olympic Games. Abe arrives in Rome, and together with the other athletes, they board a bus headed towards the athletics village. And as the bus meanders through the streets of Rome, it passes a square, Porta Capena. A sudden murmur ripples through the bus. Did you see it? 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 A hand gestures out through the window long and skeletal. The hand points at it. The Obelix of Axum. And for the first time, a baby bikila enveloped in a deep contemplative silence understands for the first time the weight of his mission in Rome a mission to reclaim Abyssinia's lost dignity. Abebe Bikila waits a lot and attentive as the good soldier that he is. The days come and go, and the finals of the marathon, 42.2 kilometers, approaches. On Saturday, September 6th, 1960, Abebe Bikila takes his starting position, wearing a red short and a green vest. The number 11 printed in bold white at the back. And who, who is that unknown, quiet Ethiopian over there? The commentators remark in a voice that is as indifferent as it is patronizing. And all of Abyssinia, seated around their transistor radio, shout, Abe is his name, Abebe Bikila, Asuaye, yeah, yeah. Asuaye. Yeah, yeah. His unofficial marathon time is laughed at and dismissed as impossible. I mean, no one. Right? No one can beat the Russian Sergei Popov's world record. No one. Abebe is bare feet. His only shoe was completely worn out, and the replacement given to him by the shoe company Adidas was too small and caused him terrible blisters. The runners played. And so he resolves to run bare feet just as he trained in the Abyssinian Highlands. On Saturday, September 6th, 1960, under the raised arm of Marcus Aurelius, the Roman marathon begins. The athletes pour out into the streets of Rome with its variable road surfaces from sets of cobblestone so rough and square to wide, open, smooth tarmac. Abebe's strategy is clear, to stay with the race leaders for the first 35 kilometers, 
Don't lead, run from behind, but in the final 10 kilometers, break away, break away and never look back. As the athletes negotiate the eight kilometers of the Appian Way, lined with cypress trees, darkness descends in the city of Rome. And the Appian Way turns into an avenue of flickering torches. Witnesses, witnesses would recount that as Abeba Bikila's feet rhythmically kissed the uneven stones, the half moonlight, the illuminated ancient Roman monuments, and hundreds upon hundreds of torch bearing soldiers had intensified the atmosphere and added to the drama. Abe. It seemed that while the others were running, he alone was floating. At Porta San Sebastiano, running with flawless speed, Abebe leaves behind his sole pursuer, the Moroccan, Radi Ben Abdisilam. He approaches the home stretch, unchallenged, and in the corner of his eyes, he sees it rising out of the darkness, the obelix of Axiom. And he knows, oh, he knows deep inside himself, he knows that the ghosts of his fourth century king have guided his iron will, given flight to his feet, powered his resolve. He just glides past the obelix of Axiom, and on those final few meters alone, and unchallenged, he crosses the finish line with grace and ease. Habebe Bikila, even after running 42.2 kilometers, he was still energetic. He just stretched and danced under the arc of Constantine while the other runners collapsed with exhaustion and dehydration into the arms of Italian soldiers. Abebe wins big, the first sub-Saharan African to win an Olympic gold medal. He breaks the world record with his time of 2 hours, 15 minutes, 16.2 seconds. Abe, the newspapers write, it took Benito Mussolini an entire army to conquer Addis Ababa. It took one Ethiopian soldier, a bodyguard, to conquer Rome. Steam? 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 Tension. 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 Some facts and figures about Abebe Bikila. Abebe Bikila become, became the only human athlete to ever win an Olympic gold medal twice in two consecutive marathons. 1960, 1964 in Tokyo, Japan. He was going for a hat trick, meaning three Olympic gold medals in the same marathon. But unfortunately, in the 19th kilometer, he had broken his stall and could not continue. He bowed out of the race and never finished. Three years later, he got into a bad accident and completely became paralyzed from waist down. And he said, I will win the next marathon on a wheelchair. He never lived to see the next. His funeral was one of the greatest. Everyone gathered, including the emperor, celebrated all across Africa. That was his story. Asuaye? 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 This next story is from Gong, Gong Town. Gong Town is a high altitude area, the closest to Nairobi, 
So any aspiring athlete who wants to train and work within the city trains in Gong. And I thought I could keep up with them. I thought I could train with them. As the sun sets in the west, its rays are caught and split into a plume of dust. August in Ngong is cold. The earth roads crack and split. On this particular day, motorbike taxis border border race up and down. Matatus move with an impatient convoy. On the roadsides are school kids. All of them in uniform, white, gray, maroon, jungle green, dark colors fit for primary school. They march their feet laboring in the scattering of dust into the evening air. See, sunsets in my mind were more romantic than this, but this, this accumulation of dust and sweat and fumes, petrol and diesel mixed with anxiety and ecstasy is enough to make me want to just do a U-turn and head back home, fully geared with my training. But then, in the horizon, I see them. A huddled group of runners appear, as if the opening credits of a film. They run at an even pace. I can't see their faces. The sun is behind them, as if its sole purpose is to illuminate the road on which they run. The sun flickers and squeezes between their moving bodies, bodies in motion. I wait for the approaching bodies to get closer. Steam? 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 As they get closer, their faces begin to show concentration, meditation, determination, exhaustion, pain. They run past me and I suddenly realize their speed fast, very fast, their feet thumping on the earth, more dust into the evening air. And I decide to chase and I run after them. But after a while, something snaps in my right knee and I stagger out of the road and haul myself on a blue gum tree. And I swear, in that moment, a gray heron patches on this street with an impressive wingspan stretched ashy gray. It stares at me with its profile <coughs> yellow winged and says to me with these exact words just because you're Kenyan doesn't mean that you can run Asuaye 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 So I do what I do and I hail a motorbike taxi and I ask the rider to follow them they run and I follow at a respectable distance not to interfere with them. Until their training ends and they peel away from the roads and they enter this compound. The slums of Ngong. I follow them in, this time on foot. It's a strange looking compound, tight, dim lit, airless, congested houses. At the center of this compound are buckets full of water, buckets to wash away the dust, the sweat, and the fumes from their bodies. The same buckets to be reused to wash those hand-me-down tracksuits and cushionless shoes, tired and worn out from surpassing their mileage. The same buckets, now muddied, will be reused to wash an outhouse perfumed with ammonia. Here, Poverty sticks out like a needle, endlessly poking at your conscience. Here, you sense the presence of other more darker, colder bodies. Rogue sports agents promising visas to race 
in foreign city marathon. Bloated corporate scouts in search of the next Kipchoge. Oil-rich countries looking to buy identity. Medical students with their laboratory spatulas gathering cell samples. Shady drug peddlers promising to enhance and triple performance. Human traffickers like diligent shopkeepers updating their stock. Poverty tourists peeping through the cracks. Government officials with their unending promises. They're all here. You can sense them. They hover around dilapidating rooftops, gathering, searching meticulously for outliers, the weak ones. I pull away before my presence is mistaken for one of these vultures, and I head back home, back to Chuile, back to one of the many houses built on the many, many hills on Gong. From this vantage point, I can at least breathe in the cool evening air. Up here, gravity and distance keeps the dust, the sweat, and the fumes away. Up here, the layout of the land changes from corrugated iron sheets to houses built with quarried stones, from open compounds to gated communities, from earth roads to tarmac to drive-ins. Here, the ambience changes, the air clears, I can hear myself, and my body registers, I see for the first time, the inequalities the gaps between extreme wealth and extreme poverty and how uncomfortably, awkwardly messy, close they sit together side by side, segregation by wealth. Wealth affords you the distance to distance yourself from that epicenter of dust and fumes and sweat. This is the reality. For these runners, to have any chance of success, they have to face Ngong's epicenter. Every day they run morning and evening. For to not run is to give up hope altogether. They run to get as far away possible from that proverbial dead end. An end which is never too far behind. If you fail to keep up, Olewako. Asoye, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. the reality of athletics is such that when you see one person winning a gold medal or a silver or bronze, there's often about a hundred, sometimes even a thousand languishing, waiting for this one chance. And there are often people hanging in the sides, praying. This next story is about someone that is well known. Kipchoge. Kipchoge. Tunae Keino. Tunae Keino. Tunae Keino. Tunae Keino. I will start with describing. A race, 1500 meter race, one of the biggest rivalries in sporting athletics, especially field and track athletics, was between Kenyans, Kipchoge Kano, and Americans, Jim Ryan. And this was in the 1500. It's called the toughest race in track and field athletics. Some say even tougher than running a marathon. You see, in a marathon, fatigue creeps up on you from burning energy glucose, from sweat dripping like a sprinkler. You are losing about a liter of water with every hour running. So fatigue creeps up on you, settles in like termite invading driftwood. It eats you up from inside until you bow out of the race. The way a test car crashes full speed into a concrete wall. To race, athletes must have 
the endurance of running long distance, the intelligence of running middle distance, and the power of running sprint. I want you to picture a 400 meter truck. To race 1,500 meters, athletes go around this truck three and three quarters of a lap. The fast 40 meters sprint fast, as fast as you can. But after that, settle down. Don't push too hard, but be sure to keep up with the race leaders, a huddled group of runners sharing in the rigors of the race. The fast two laps, you breathe with ease if you can keep up. It's in the final lap that trouble begins to strike you. You see, your heart is not pumping blood fast enough. Oxygen is not getting to your muscles fast enough. Your muscles can no longer expand and contract. Sharp pains fire up to the brain. We need more oxygen. A message is relayed, but the heart can't pump any faster. You spend the rest of the race in oxygen debt. Everything tightens. And the brain, to protect your body from major organ damage, shuts down all muscular function. You experience that acute, heavy, dead leg feeling that makes you want to just slow down. Slow down. Curl up into a ditch, suck your thumb, and take a nap. <laughs> the inability to re Repeat a given level of muscular force results in acute impairment. You slow down just at the point where you must speed up the home stretch, the final 100 meters. But where does the energy come from? You spent all your power, all your endurance, all your intelligence, everything is gone. What now keeps you going is that stubborn, unstoppable irrational, unreasonable, nerve center, the human spirit, the stick to itiveness that digs deep and finds the energy needed to power through to the cross line. You finish the race, the race is over. It's after you finish the race does your body begin to register the impact. Everything hurts. Your head hurts. Your heart wants to break through the ribcage. Life returns back to your legs, now pulsating with pain. Your stomach tightens like a sailor's knot. Everything hurts. And yet, you have to gather yourself and do this all over again. It's in this particular race that one of the greatest rivalries begun. Jim Ryan and Kipchoge Kano. The two of them, thank you. Asuaye, Asuaye. The two of them were competing for the title at the Olympic Games in 1968. And before the Games, they would meet several times across different places. Friendlies, training, running together. You monkey. And Kano answered, I didn't know I'm a monkey. In my country, I'm a human being. And the man said, if you dare run, I'll blow your brains out. Unrelenting, he ran. Lights down. It's 
the men's 1500 meter finals. You can hear there 45,000 spectators have showed up for this competition. There they are. You can hear them shouting for the world record holder Jim Ryan as he enters the stadium. There is Jim Ryan getting into the stadium. You can hear, you can see him stretching up and down and stretching his quads. Jim Ryan, a true prodigy of track and field athletics, America's most celebrated middle distance runner. His simply sensational broke two world records when he was just barely age 19. Jim Ryan is simply amazing, unbeatable, unconquerable, and only one man stands in the way. The Kenyan Kipchoge Kano. Kano, of course, is nowhere to be seen at the moment, always preferring that grand last entrance into the stadium. Kano, a man of tactical intelligence, he is a police officer, started off in the general service unit, then served as a bodyguard of the first president of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, and now promoted to the position of chief inspector. Kane, of course, as we say, the man of tactical intelligence, but always lacking in the power needed to outrun Jim Ryan. Jim Ryan is simply at the top of his game. It's going to be another predictable win for, Kane, for, for Jim Ryan, enough, in fact to make Kano want to retire and stick to his job as a police officer. Jim Ryan, there he is, getting into the starting lineup. There are eight athletes on the starting lineup. They include Jim Ryan, Jim Greller from America, Alan Simpson, John Wilkinson, Andy Green, Mungai of Kenya, and there is Kipchoge Kano getting into the stadium wearing number five. You can see there the race officials getting them onto their mark. They're off and straight away Wilkinson goes off on the Kenyan pace eight. A moon guy didn't go off quite as fast. In fact, Kano is left right at the back. This is astonishing. As the Kenyans have been known to set a fast early pace, but not today is Wilkinson going down for break. Britain in the lead, John Wetton, Great Britain in second place, and Green, Great Britain in third and fourth. For once, it's the British boys with a positive attitude in this race. The Kenyans have done nothing at all, and they're lumbering along at the back, a complete reversal of what was expected, and they're going very wide there on the back straight. As they come up now to the fast lap, we can start to extrapolate what sort of time and tempo they're running at. The lap is slow, 60.5 seconds. The lap is slow. I doubt we'll be seeing another world record today, but there, Green, Great Britain in the lead. Welcome for Great Britain in second. And my goodness, look at Kano at the back, at the pace too slow. It really is too slow. I cannot understand why the Kenyans have done this. Green, Great Britain in the lead. Welcome, Great Britain. Second, and now we can see there Jim Ryan, the world record holder, is beginning to move. Jim Ryan, Jim Ryan, wearing number three, is starting to move. Ryan, up third place, Ryan is going for the lead. Oh my goodness, Jim Ryan is in the lead. Jim Ryan is in the lead. It's simply amazing, this young man. My goodness, simply unstoppable and beaten. It's going to be another win from Ryan. Whoa, 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 look from the back, look at Kano! Look at Kano! Kano is beginning to move! You can see those piston-like legs firing up and down and accelerating his body forward. Kano up fourth place, Kano up third place, Kano chasing hard now, Jim Ryan up second place. Kano holding on on the outside lane, Jim Ryan holding on on the inside lane. Can Kano do it? Can Kano beat Jim Ryan? The perfect world record. The young Kenyan moon guy coming very wide there on the back straight as they come up now to the home stretch. My goodness, the race is starting to get interesting. It's neck to neck between Kipchoge Kano and Jim Ryan. And you can see Ryan turning to look. And his face is startled. To see Kipchoge Kano, his worst nightmare. He really is too close. Don't look back, Ryan. Go, Ryan, go. 
Kano chasing hard on the outside lane. Jim Ryan holding on on the inside lane. Still the American leads. You can almost hear his every inhale and exhale. His face contorted. Kano chasing hard, comfortable, holding on, getting close. Final, a hundred meters. Audience is now up on their feet. Cheer. Flags waving side to side, feet up from the ground, eyes bulging out, dying to see who will win this race. You can almost taste the anxiety floating in the stadium like a dark cloud. Jim Ryan unleashes his famous weapon. The Kenyans call it the Sting. His unrivaled finishing kick. Jim Ryan accelerates, crosses the finish line. Kane of second, and rest falls. And finishing last is Andy Green. Lights up. This was 1967, a year before the Olympics. And finally, the day arrived, the Olympic Games. And Kano had everything you can imagine going against him. As one of the most favored athletes from the Kenyan team, he had been entered not only in one race, not only in two races, but three races, 1,500 meters, 5,000 meters, 10,000 meters. And Jim Ryan, his rival, had only prepared all his life for one race, 1,500 meters. And he only arrived competing in one race. 1,500 meters. Not only did Kano have to run in all these races, he also had to compete in the qualifiers. So he was exhausted. At the finals of the 500 meters, Kano was second, winning silver. The days went. At the finals, of the 10,000 meters, two laps to the finish, Kano suddenly collapses and rolls out from the field. He's experiencing incredible pain in his gallbladder. It's infected. He pulls himself together, runs the remaining two laps, but when he finishes, the officials disqualify him for leaving the track. That evening, Kano is attended by his doctors, and he's told that he has gallstones, and they're about to bust. And he's warned not to compete again. If he dares to compete, it might be fatal. He's pacing around wondering whether to go or not, wondering whether to compete or not. His great rival, Jim Ryan, is just resting, waiting, ready, he's prepared. Kano goes to sleep undecided. And the next day when he wakes up, he decides he's going to run. But there is one thing. He's been left by the bus. He overslept. His doctors had recommended a full night's rest. And now, the race is about to begin, and Kano is nowhere to be seen. He decides to go on the streets of Mexico City, 
running towards the, Olymp towards the Olympic Stadium. He boards a bus, thinking that it was going to get him there faster. Traffic done. He covers the remaining distance and arrives just, just on time as they are reading the names of the athletes. He takes the starting line next to Jibjo from Kenya. The race begins fast 40 meters. Something happens that has never happened in this race. Jibjo shoots like a bullet going fast. And remember the rules of the game is that you have to keep up with the race leader. So everyone else goes at the pace of Jibjo, but it's punishing pace. And so they burn up quickly. But Keno is running from behind. The first lap. The second lap. As they approach the finals, Keno starts to move. He goes up. Crossing every one of them, every one, catches up with Jibjo, crosses Jibjo, Jibjo pulls back. It's a final, 300 meters. Ryan wakes up. He sees the finish line, starts to chase after Kano. But Kano is so far away, no one can catch up with him crossed the finish line, won gold, broke the world record. And not only that, not only that, not only that, in the history of this race, he created the largest winning margin between himself and the athlete next. A distance of 20 meters between him and Jim Ryan. Tunae Keino, Tunae Keino, Tunae Keino, Tunae Keino. Ryan never won an Olympic race. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In fact, he retreated and became a politician. <laughs> My final story is from a Tanzanian runner called John Stephen Akwari. <coughs> Mexico City, 1968. The finals of the marathon, 42.2 kilometers, are about to begin. And on the lineup are 75 runners. Amongst them, the Tanzanian runner, John Stephen Aquaro. Tall, lean, wearing the colors of his nation's flag. These finals of the marathon are predicted to be one of the most punishing because Mexico City rises over 7,000 feet above sea level. The high altitude, thin air, is going to make this a very pu punishing race. And sure enough, when the race begins, <coughs> things get tough. Even before reaching the half marathon mark, 21.1 kilometers, close to 20 athletes pull out of the race, complaining of tightness in breath, dehydration, exhaustion, fatigue. They pull out. Amongst the huddled group of runners ahead, 
is John Stephen Aquara. They are approaching the 19th kilometer. And as they are moving, this huddled group of runners, the space between them starts to shrink. It starts to get too tight. And Aquari is sandwiched right in the middle. What started off as a friendly jostling, pulling, tagging, pushing, trying to break free, trying to find an open way to go, quickly became nasty, ugly. And out of nowhere, John Stephen Aquari is knocked hard by one of the athletes. He loses balance, and his body comes crashing down on the tarmac. With the speed he was moving at, the crash is tragic. He hits hard on the pavement of his shoulder. On top of that, he tours a hole on his right knee. And just, if you think, it can't get any much worse. He dislocates the joint on the right knee. His race for gold is completely finished. As he's lying there, writhing and wiggling in incredible pain, the remaining athletes cross, racing towards the finish line. Two hours, 20 minutes, 26 seconds since the start of the race, Mamo Walde of Ethiopia crosses the finish line, winning gold. About an hour later, all the remaining athletes have crossed the finish line. The race officials set up the winner's podium. Mamo Walde is crowned with gold. The Ethiopian anthem can be heard from miles and miles away. And after that, they turn off the clock. The crowd starts to trickle and then pour out into the streets of Mexico City. Camera crews began to pack up their gear. Another Olympic finished. When word, word starts to pass around that there's still one more athlete out there in the streets of Mexico City. The camera crews were the first to unpack their gear and go out and look for him. They were followed by police escorts and medics. And sure enough, sure enough, they found him. John Stephen Aquara. He had picked himself up, bandaged his knee, walked, and kept running. Noticing the severity of his injuries, the, the hard shoulders, the bruised knee, the dislocated knee, the paramedics were pleading with him to stop running and seek immediate medical attention. But Aquari would hear none of it. He just kept running. forcing everyone to run behind him. Police, medics, camera crews. The crowd started to line up along the way, cheering him on. The few that had left come, went back into the stadium, waiting for him. And he kept going. He would stop. until the stadium came into sight and everyone started to clap and cheer him on and he kept going and going until he crossed the finish line. Immediately, immediately he was done, the camera crews, journalists, all surrounded him and asked him, John, 
In his own words, this is what he said. Nilipomaliza mbio hizi wale wapiga picha na wanahabari wale nizunguka. Wakaniuliza, John, ulijua kwamba hautaweza kushinda mbio hizi. Ni nini haswa kilikufanya uzidi kuendelea? Nami nikawajibu inji yangu haikunituma maili elfu tano kuanza mbio bali ilinituma maili elfu tano kumaliza mbio when the journalists surrounded him they asked him john you you knew you knew you were never going to win this race so why keep going and he answered my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. Thank you for your time. Someone who's left their phone, I'm told to announce in the gents. If you think it's you, please <laughs> uh, see the officials. I Maybe see you me. have questions. Or I see. Yes. So it's okay. <laughs> Some of us saw the race. <laughs> I have a question. And so this was the first actual grounding for, for that research, was meeting him and seeing his work and talking about, uh, so I also had a meeting with him. But the other is also just uh, primary research, but also I've been, and also like direct uh, interaction with athletes because running is something that has been, in, has interested me since 2012, uh, when I was part of the Olympic, uh, of, the, of the cultural Olympiads uh, during the London Marathon. And so I've worked on several things around running. I've also worked with six actors where we went to a high altitude training camp, lived there, worked there with athletes, and also exchanged stories. And this is where things like uh, the, the conflict with human trafficking, with doping, all these stories started coming up there. And so it was how do you, how, the, the, the task for me in this work was, was how to contextualize them on a historical place. He's considered the most famous athlete to finish last. Uh, 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 John Stephen Aquari. I think one of when I'm research, when I was researching and talking to athletes around long distance running, everyone would tell me that the goal is never to win the race. It's always to start and finish. And so for me, this this idea and it's the idea of endurance. And part of my research was the interest between the sort of dialogue between vulnerability and resilience. 
and how do you capture that? Because you're putting your body under incredible strain for a very long period of time. And yet you, you still keep going. And in a way, it's, it's metaphorical. It's also about, it's metaphorical of, of, the, of the continent in a way, you know, this balance uh, between both vulnerability and at, at the same time uh, resilience to just keep going no matter what. One of the, the title for, for this work was a poem that I got from uh, Jill's Court Heron. And to finish this, I'll, I'd like to recite that poem. <laughs> um, it's called Running. Because I always feel like running, not away, because there is no such place. Because if there was, I would have found it by now. Because it's easier to run, easier than staying and finding out you're the only one who didn't run. Because running will be the way your life and mine will be described. As in the long run. Or as in having given someone a run for his money. Or as in running out of time. Because running makes me look like everyone else, though I hope there will never be cause for that. Because I'll be running in the other direction. Not running because of fear. Because the thing I fear cannot be escaped, eluded, avoided, hidden from, gotten away from. Not without showing the fear as I see it now. Because closer, nearer, closer, clearer, because of you, and because of that nice that you quietly, quickly be causing. And because you're going to see me run soon. And because you're going to know why I'm running then. You'll know then. Because I'm not going to tell you now. <laughs>